The next item of business is a stage three debate on motion 9599 in the name of Angela Constance on bail and release from custody Scotland bill. I'd be grateful if members who wish to speak in the debate were to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on Angela Constance to speak to and move the motion up to seven minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. I am pleased to open this debate on the bail and release from custody Scotland bill. I'd like to start by expressing my sincere thanks to the committees who took part in considering the bill, in particular the Criminal Justice Committee eh, for its careful and thorough scrutiny of the bill over the past year. And I also want to, to thank eh, the Scottish Government's bill team also. But in particular, I want to say a special thank you to everyone eh, who has engaged with the committee and with government during the development and the passage of this bill. Your engagement and input have undoubtedly made the bill better. Sign officer, I want to start by summarising how the bill will make a positive difference in how imprisonment is used and in supporting the effective eh, reintegration of people leaving prison. The bill has two main purposes. The first is to focus the use on remand on those who pose the greatest risk to public safety or threaten the delivery of justice, and I will discuss in a moment how it does that. The changes brought about by this bill eh, on their own will not radically reduce the remand population, and certainly not in the short term. And this is a point that we have all eh, acknowledged on a cross-party basis, including victims' organisations. But the bill ensures that remand and imprisonment are reserved for those who pose a risk to the safety of victims and communities. There is no single solution to reduce the use of remand in Scotland, which again everyone in this chamber agrees we need to do. This bill is one part, albeit an important part, of a wider approach, along with action to address the court backlog and invest in alternatives to remand. The second purpose of the bill is to improve the support provided to people leaving prison. That benefits all of us and the communities that we seek to serve. I listened carefully to the tragic examples members highlighted yesterday where that support had not been in place and the devastating consequences that can have. I am clear that we can do more to support people leaving our prisons and to keep them and others safe and this bill aims to do that. I would like to highlight some specific provisions which I believe have the potential to bring about real and lasting change. That includes ending scheduled liberations on a Friday and the day before a public holiday, placing new duties on the wider public sector to engage in pre-release planning so that planning starts at an earlier point in a prisoner's <laughs> time in custody. That includes remand and sentence prisoners and also those released direct from court. In establishing national statutory through care standards that will include uh, remand as well as sentence prisoners, we will ensure more consistent support for people leaving prison across Scotland. So taken together, this should lead to more people leaving custody with the support they need in place <coughs> and not just a list of appointments which they might struggle to attend. Presiding officer, I want to specifically focus on the concerns that victims groups such as Victim Support Scotland and Scottish Women's Aid have about the move to a single bail test and the removal of the presumption in favour of remand for certain cases. I acknowledge their concerns about victims' uh, views and perceptions of these changes and it is only right that I address them directly here today. Given the trauma experienced by victims of crime, they should and must have confidence in our justice system. But I want to be clear, the single test of bail will allow a court to remand someone accused of a serious sexual offence or a serious domestic eh, abuse offence, particularly where there has been eh, a track record of offending. These are the cases currently covered by the presumption in favour of remand, and this is exactly the type of cases under the single bail test where remand will be used. In fact, the new bail test emphasises that. And that is because while the single bail test recognises that remand should be used as a last resort, it makes clear that remand is necessary 
where victim safety is put at risk. That is why the Bill means the Court must specifically consider safety of the victim from harm when applying the new bail test. Importantly, the concept of harm in the Bill includes both physical and psychological harm. The uses, it, this uses the same definition as in the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act 2018. And as a result of this bill, the type of harm arising from coercive and controlling behaviour is explicitly recognised by the bail test. In addition to this focus on the new bail test, steps have been taken to further emphasise the importance of victim safety in the bill through amendments. And that includes Maggie Chapman's amendments agreed yesterday to emphasise the importance of victim safety information being sought from the prosecutor when the court is making their bail decision. Parliament yesterday also agreed amendments to require information to be collected on the use of bail in cases previously covered by the presumption in favour of remand. In the coming years, this will aid understanding of how the new bail test is operating uh, for these category of cases. Presiding officer, we have been open to making improvements to this bill throughout the process while maintaining a firm focus on what the bill seeks to achieve. And I am very grateful to everyone who has provided their time and their expertise to inform amendments. I do believe that this bill will ensure that the use of remand is firmly focused on public and victim safety. I also believe it will improve the opportunity for the rehabilitation and reintegration of people leaving prison. I believe that, will, that this will make a positive difference and will keep people safe. And I move that Parliament agrees that the bail and release from custody Scotland bill be passed. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today marks the end of a long journey for the bail and release from custody bill. Whilst it seems quite technical in nature, it attracted a cross range of outlooks, experiences and views of our criminal justice system. And it's a bill which will have far reaching consequences, consequences which we must consider as our duty to. We face important questions about this bill. Is this bill in part or in whole entirely necessary? Will it improve outcomes for those who interact with our criminal justice system? Will it make people's lives safer and better? Does it increase or decrease the risk or any perceived risk posed to them? And does it produce better outcomes than the status quo? Because legislation, wherever it comes from, must meet all of those criteria, in my view, to be passable in this place. In fairness, there are parts of the bill which do pass those tests, and most of them lie in part two of the bill, and I support them, and I welcome them. There are, however, parts which do not. And I think it would be very predictable and probably quite easy for us as politicians simply to divide down the traditional political lines on this, to oppose for opposing sake on this side, and to resist compromise on the other, on the wrong assumption that it is somehow motivated by ideology. I'll be honest, presiding officer, I find that whole approach rather depressing, which is why I approach this bill like I approach any other, with an open mind, a constructive attitude, and a willingness to listen, to listen to those who know what these changes mean out there in the real world, rather than in the confines of a committee room, which is why our stage one report perhaps was unanimous, which is why we got out of our comfort zone. We visited prisons and courts. We met with victims and judges and advocates and staff and police and their unions. Which is why at stage one I laid out my own thoughts right at this place in the chamber as to where I thought the bill meant well, but also there was scope for improvement. And I have to say, on the day, that was met by the typical bombast to which I sadly became accustomed to from the former Justice Secretary, which is a direct compliment to the current one, I should add. And which is why my party introduced 24 amendments at stage two. 33 amendments at stage three, and I personally introduced 29 in both, and many of my amendments were drafted in conjunction with those very organisations like Victim Sports Scotland, Rape Crisis Scotland, Assist, Scottish Women's Aid, and so many others. Because when every other public service shuts their door at three o'clock on a Friday afternoon, they are always there for their victims and their families. And I make no apologies for being guided in my approach to this bill uh, with them and by them. And our amendments, many of them, Amendments which sought to improve information given to and from victims in relation to custody hearings were voted down. Our amendments to scrap the formula which equated two days electronically tagged on bail to one day in prison voted down. Our amendment to record the reasons for why bail was granted voted down. 
to give judges the ultimate flexibility and discretion on bail and to remove the new two-part test, which is the cause of so much concern, voted down. To stop the emergency release of prisoners without scrutiny or approval of this parliament, voted down. To stop the early release of prisoners in a four-year sentence after serving just 18 months of it. Guess what? Voted down as well, presiding officer. And of course, to remove section three, which itself removes section 23D from law, that vital safeguard for victims of domestic abuse, voted down too. Nothing, nothing substantive that was asked of the government by me, by other members, and more importantly, by these victims' organisations, who pleaded at every step of the way for the government to listen, was accepted. Not one of them. And it wasn't my amendments which were voted down. It was their voices which were shut down in all of this. And I suspect they are as angry as they are saddened today, despite the comments made by the Cabinet Secretary already. And all for what? So the government can say we are tackling Scotland's Roman population on the assumption that these changes will do so. When actually on the assumption that judges are willfully sending people to prison when perhaps they shouldn't be. The number of untried prisoners arriving into custody has dropped by 35% over the last 10 years. Whilst at the same time, the length of time on remand due to backlogs has doubled. There's your remand problem right there in one statistic. But we ploughed on with a bill, a bill which makes two fundamental errors. One, that the bail test be amended, which I and many, many others have serious doubts about. And two, the removal of a much needed safeguard, a safeguard which determines whether someone accused of serious domestic abuse or assault is remanded into custody or is released. Section 23D is not a buzzword for lobby groups. It is a very real protection in law which was created in response to the horrendous rise in violence against women and girls. And I have to say, shame on any MSP who voted against my amendment yesterday to retain that protection. The words of Victim Sport Scotland and their friends and partners in their 11th hour appeal to MSPs today are thus. The safety of victims should be at the heart of decision making. The new bill test is not sufficient to keep people safe. And it does little to show victims of serious crime that their safety is being protected under the law. That is a devastating assessment of any bill at stage three, in my view. And I proudly give them the last word today. And I do so because it is deeply personal to me. As the only child of a family of domestic abuse, I owe so much to organizations like them. And that is my promise to them. You made it your red line and it is my red line too. And that is why, presiding officer, I cannot support the bail and release from custody bill. And I ask members not to listen to me or even to their whips, but listen to the voices to whom this bill matters and to their own conscience. Mine is clear. I hope others can say the same. Thank you. I now call on Pauline McNeill. Up to five minutes, please. Presiding officer, thank you to the bill team to make themselves available to the Scottish Labour team and to the committee clerks for an incredible support through creating the Stage 1 report. At Stage 1 and 2, Scottish Labour stated that it could not support the bail and release bill from custody if the Scottish Government did not address serious deficiencies within the bill and crucially provide clarity over the purpose of the bill. But there has not been any consistency from the Scottish Government team on whether the bill's purpose is aimed at reducing the remand population or something else. So when the former Cabinet Secretary was first asked to clarify the purpose of the bill, he did not confirm that the purpose was to restrict the use of remand and subsequently seemed hesitant to, to confirm that that was the purpose. Now, I appreciate that yesterday under the constant Cabinet Secretary used exactly that language, but I need to emphasise right up until that point we have been trying to clarify the actual purpose of the bill in, to, in relation to Part 1. On page one of the bill itself, the description does not use that language. It says the policy objective of the bill states that its purpose is to refocus how imprisonment is used. It does say the use of custody for a man is a last resort to give greater focus to the rehabilitation and reintegration of individuals leaving custody. And whilst the policy objective does say that the bill's decision-making framework is to be reserved for those who pose a serious public safety risk, including victim safety, when it's necessary to prevent a significant risk of prejudice to the interests of justice on a given case, 
it is hard to see why the new bail test would make any real difference from the old one contained in the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995, which of course is a presumption for bail. With a possible exception of what Jamie Green referred to is the provision to delete section 23 of the 95 Act, which means in all solemn cases where there has been an analogous previous conviction on specified serious offences, including domestic violence, that they must be remanded to custody unless there are exceptional circumstances. It has been removed uh, through the Bill. So we do not have any evidence either way of whether keeping it or removing it would make any actual difference to the remand population, and its deletion does not have the confidence of support, victim support organisations. And last night, Victim Support Scotland uh, and Scottish Women's Aid and Assist urged members to vote against the bill to protect the interests of people affected by crime in Scotland. And they are adamant that the removal of this vital safeguard presents a serious risk to the safety of people affected by crime in Scotland, in particular victims of gender-based violence. Now, the Scottish Government did try to explain their position today and disagreed with that assessment, but I do not think they have adequately explained what the removal of Section 23 would result in, and do not think they have adequately worked with victims' organisations to convince them of the need for removing of this section. Uh, the Chamber should remember that subsection 3AC, which added domestic abuse to the category of offending, was only contained within the legislation uh, from 2018 forward. So victims' organisations last night reiterated that 23D, in their opinion, is still a vital part of Scotland's commitment to erating, eradicating violence against women and girls. We are all concerned about having one of the highest levels of remand uh, population in Europe, but on the face of it, the bill does not appear to change that. One of the biggest factors, as already been mentioned, is lengthy waiting times for court hearings, which we did try to reduce over the course of uh, now up to 2026. So we believe a primary focus should be to get those waiting times down. So the Scottish Government has not given any indication of what specific reduction it anticipates seeing. I, I do appreciate what the Cabinet Secretary said today uh, about that. But the concerns of Scotland's judiciary, as we discussed at stage three yesterday, has also caused me a great deal of concern, and I'm not convinced that the issues raised by Lord Carloway in his 13-page letter have been adequately addressed, and he, of course, on behalf of the Senators of the College of Justice. And during the consultation process, Lord Carloway stated that the bill introduces an unnecessary, cumbersome and artificial process. He said that it was difficult to see how the proposed new structure would make any real practical difference to the outcomes, because the overarching test that bail is to be granted, unless there is a good reason to refuse it, remains the same. So the Scottish Government's vision for justice in the Scotland programme aims to have a justice system which prioritises the experience of victims of crime and places women and children at the heart of service delivery. But there are many things in part two of the bill that are very important in the management and release of prisoners. But I don't think it's enough for us to pass this legislation uh, today, because I think some of that could be done uh, not by legislation. So as we uh, proceed to the final vote this evening, we believe, uh, Scottish Labour believe, we must balance the interests of justice uh, for those accused of crimes and the safety of victims. Uh, there is a clear consensus amongst all the parties so that this Parliament needs to do more work in changing the experiences of victims. I did try and put what was quite a serious amendment yesterday on what I think is the gap in the law in relation to the notification for bail. I would bills. ask you to conclude, Ms McNeill. Um, but the government didn't accept that either, and that was quite deflating. That Nothing that we suggested it seemed to. On that, I'm resolute on my commitment to, to victims on behalf of Scottish Labour, but tonight, unfortunately, Scottish Labour cannot support the bill this evening. Thank you. I now call on Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you. Can I start by uh, commending the Criminal Justice Committee, and particularly the small number of MSP colleagues uh, across the parties who did the bulk of the heavy lifting with the amendments uh, yesterday, and add my thanks also to the many stakeholders whose insight and expertise has obviously informed Parliament's scrutiny of the Bill. As I did at stage one, I think it is important perhaps to underline why I believe reform of bail and release is necessary. Scotland's prison population is amongst the highest in Europe uh, and growing. It has led to overcrowding, poor conditions and problems undertaking the sort of purposeful activity and through care essential for rehabilitation and reducing the risk of reoffending. This situation is not sustainable, nor is it safe. 
The growth in the prison population has been driven largely, not exclusively, but largely by the numbers on remand. The majority, despite what Jamie Green says, and I, and I, I accept the figures he said, but the, those on remand are the majority untried. Even as the population of sentenced prisoners fell during emergency COVID releases, the remand population grew because of the backlog in our courts. Uh, and as important as tackling that backlog is, and Jamie Green made that point again yesterday, the problem in relation to remand certainly predates uh, COVID. So Scottish Liberal Democrats have no difficulty with the policy memorandum when it states, and I quote, the provisions of the bill are intended to ensure that the use of custody for remand is a last resort. At the same time, obviously, a balance must be struck with the rights and safety of victims and witnesses, and that was the focus of much of the attention yesterday. In this respect, again, I thank uh, organisations like Victim Support Scotland for helping us understand the experience of victims when it comes to the bail system. I know they have real misgivings about aspects of the new bail test and understand why that is the case. However, I think some of the amendments passed at stage two and again yesterday have improved the substance of the test and clarified the interpretation. Consideration of victims as well as public safety is now more explicit and front and centre. I appreciate the repeal of Section 23D has caused particular anxiety, in part perhaps because of the message it is seen to send. I don't in any way underestimate the level of that concern. On balance, though, I think embedding victim and public safety more explicitly in a single bail test is appropriate. That said, this will need to be closely monitored, and Parliament will obviously take a keen interest in scrutinising reports that government must now provide going forward. Another area where ongoing focus will be required is in the resourcing of criminal justice social work, which is set to take on an enhanced role in informing court decisions around bail and remand. That is as it should be, but certainly cannot be achieved on the cheap. It provides a way of ensuring the court is aware of victims' needs and safety requirements, and I welcome the changes made at stage three on the basis of the amendments I brought at stage, uh, stage two. However, with council budgets under pressure, ministers must ensure that they will the means as well as the ends in relation to the role of criminal justice social work. Uh, due to chairing duties uh, yesterday, I did not take part in the debate, but I, I think overall was impressed by the tone of the contributions, even where opinions differed markedly. And I think that is again reflected so far in the debate uh, this afternoon. I draw special attention to the exchanges around Jamie Green's so-called Suzanne's Law uh, provisions, which, while not passed, did allow for an important De, uh, de, important debate, but also a statement, I think, of collective intent. Um, I was, like Jamie Green, disappointed that proposed amendments to the emergency re, um, release powers weren't agreed. There were a number of options. I think it was disappointing that none of those were taken up. All in all, though, this bill, I think, introduces necessary reforms that can help balance the need to address the problems arising from Scotland's high and growing um, remand population with the interests of victims and the wider public. And on that basis, the Scottish Liberal Democrats will be supporting it at decision time this evening. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to open debate speakers, and I call Audrey Nicholl to be followed by Sharon Dowie. Thank you, presiding officer. I am very pleased to speak in this afternoon's debate. Most of my contribution will be in my capacity as convener of the Criminal Justice Committee. And I again thank witnesses, the bills and clerks, team, parliament staff and organisations and individuals who supported and informed our scrutiny. This is an important bill and I want to note from the outset that although the committee did not reach consensus on all of the issues we considered, we were able to reach an amicable view in our report on this bill. So let me start where most consensus was found. Part two of the bill proposes changes to the process of release, including planning for release, accessing services and through care, as well as release on certain days of the week, the release on licence, powers to release early and victim notification. Committee members were clear in their support for most of the provisions in this part of the bill. Through care plans for prisoners and access to key services, including housing, benefits, health care and medication on release, are essential to support reintegration and avoid the revolving door of recidivism setting up people to fail. And as the committee heard, release planning must start the day someone enters prison. A particular issue of personal interest to me is how to better support prisoners released unexpectedly by a court. And I'm pleased that the government accepted my amendments, providing ministers with a regulation making power to further 
to make further provision in this area of release planning if necessary. Part one of the bill proposes important changes to the use of bail. And it was here that committee members differed on some of the key provisions in the bill. Some members wanted the government to be clearer about what they wanted to achieve with this bill, as has already been articulated by other members. So did they, for example, propose the changes so that being granted bail would be more likely and that this would in turn bring down the numbers held on remand, which we all agree are too high? As noted at stage one, the, the Scottish Government has not set a specific target for the number of cases where it expects that the outcome would be different under the revised bail test. So this made it harder for the committee to scrutinise the likely difference to the numbers of people being granted bail where they would previously have been remanded. We also had concerns about the resource implications for the wider role of justice social work in bail decision making and if this in fact would slow down the process. There were also differences of opinion on the proposal to remove section 23D from the 1995 Act and around the provisions on the consideration of how time spent on electronic mon monitoring whilst on bail may be taken into account during sentences. But despite these differences, all members agreed that there were some useful provisions in the bill. So to conclude, uh, resourced properly, the bill's provisions will go a long way to improving the release process for prisoners. And despite our differences, the bill benefited from robust scrutiny at stage one and from amending at stages two and three. This is especially so in relation to part one of the bill, where views in the committee differed. I look forward to the Criminal Justice Committee undertaking further scrutiny on the legislative provisions to follow and confirming that we have indeed delivered some positive reform to bail and release from custody. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Sharon Dowie to be followed by Carol Moffin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My party has serious concerns about the damage this bill could do. Regrettably, this bill is yet another example of the SNP's soft touch approach to justice. The needs of criminals are once again being prioritised over the rights of victims. This bill seeks to reduce Scotland's prison population. It seeks to let criminals out early. It seeks to remove restrictions that protect people from dangerous offenders. Unfortunately, and I don't see this lightly, this bill would put public safety at greater risk. Before I get into broader arguments, I will first outline the specific sections of the bill that deeply concern us. Section 2 makes it more difficult to remand an accused offender in prison. Section 3 removes some restrictions on bail being granted in the most serious of cases heard by juries, such as violent, sexual and domestic abuse offences. Section 5 allows time spent on electronic monitoring to be deducted from an offender's sentence. Section 7 allows SNP ministers to release prisoners for up to six months at a time, even before the parole board recommends release. And Section 8 allows SNP ministers to release prisoners early from their sentence without parliamentary approval. We have raised issues with those sections throughout the bill process. Yet the SNP has refused to make the necessary changes to improve this legislation. So if it passes, what impact will this bill have? Firstly, it will not deal with one of the main sources of the problem. Scotland's remand prison population is high, in large part, because there is such a large court backlog. A recent Audit Scotland report said the backlog will not be cleared until March 2026. So instead of tackling the root of the problem by working to clear the court backlog, the SNP government is trying to take the easy way out by seeking to empty prisons. This approach will have profound consequences. The increased risk to public safety is so clear that it is stunning the SNP government does not recognise it. One in four crimes are committed by those on bail. In the last year for which we have data, that amounted to 15,724 crimes and offences. 
Those figures include the most serious crimes, from rapes to murder. Yet this SNP law will release even more criminals on bail and cut time off already short prison sentences. This is not justice. But statistics only tell a small part of the story. Specific cases are more enlightening. A few years ago, Robbie Smullen stabbed Barry Dixon in the heart and killed him. Barry was 22. A witness in the trial said that Smullen wasn't upset afterwards. He was bragging about it. Barry Dixon's murderer was on three different bail orders when he committed that vile crime. Barry's aunt, Jade Taylor, said this. It's as if it's unacceptable for our children and loved ones to be collateral damage because of policies they have put in place simply to save money. We are talking about murders, rapes and serious assaults that would never have happened if the monstrous individuals responsible were remanded in prison instead of repeatedly being granted bail while continuing to offend. The government must reflect on the words of Barry Dixon's family. They must consider the horrific and tragic consequences that can come from letting criminals walk the streets freely on bail. If they carry on with this bill, it could increase the risk to public safety. It could mean more victims and more broken families across Scotland. It could stack the justice system even more in favour of criminals. I urge colleagues across the chamber to think again and vote against this bill. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Carol Mockin to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Thank you, presiding officer. I think we can all agree that given giving greater focus to reintegrating people when they are released from prison is a worthwhile and essential cause. Reforming how we utilise remand is key to that, and I'm certainly supportive of all efforts to do so if they effectively achieve that aim. Sadly, on balance, I do not believe the bail and release from custody bill achieves that aim. I say that because at times it has been difficult to really ascertain what the government is seeking to do with this bill. My colleague Pauline McNeill articulated how clouded some of their explanations have been during, during its progress through this parliament. In particular, Scottish Labour would like to see more evidence that the Scottish Government are committed and able to shift and financially resource alternatives to custody. The Scottish Government seem to miss the point that much of what we all hope to achieve needs resourcing and best practice, not additional layers of bureaucracy. We really cannot say with any clarity that this bill, you know, what this bill's intended purpose is, what effects it might have and how it will be delivered at all. Um, I think, simply put, the bill just not, does not seem ready. There is important work here, and I do not doubt the good intentions, and I, I say that quite genuinely. I thought yesterday the ca Cabinet Secretary was clearly engaged, and she was very considered and took the responses from individuals very seriously. And in our discussions at stage through three, I was impressed at how, in, how engaged she was with parliamentarians across, across the chamber. So I do thank her for that. Um, the committee stage, however, in, in my view, as someone who wasn't involved in the process and, and looking through some of the committee stages, suggested we require much greater research detailing why so many people are on remand in Scotland and what specific issues cause that. Um, yes, some of it is due to the COVID backlog that had been mentioned, but levels were stubborn, stubbornly high even before that. And the Criminal Justice Committee have sought to shed light on these issues, but it appears the government have decided to push ahead regardless. The committee clearly would have wished to understand better how the provision of this bill would have changed those things. What we do know for, as a fact, as others have said, Scotland has the highest remand rates in Europe and it cannot be allowed to continue. Will this bill decrease the number of people on remand? Well, the answer is, unfortunately, we do not really know. And in my view, the way we, the way we could have said that with any clarity is if the data, as suggested by the Criminal Justice Committee, had been pursued by the Scottish Government um, and they did not seem to support the efforts on that. Um, on top of that, what we know, and others have mentioned this, is the testimony given to the committee that organisations representing victims and victims themselves and their families do not have confidence in this bill. Um, and 
nor do many criminal justice focused um, judges and, and organisations. In fact, I would say um, I've rarely seen a bill at this stage which has received so much criticism from expert groups. Um, and I would press the government to think much more carefully about the concerns and experiences of victims in the fi final formulation of this bill um, and how it can be sustained if it comes to be passed into law over the longer terms. These voices must be heard. Um, on the matter of, of, of how the judges have been, react, re, been reacting, um, judges being required to register reasons for refusing bail, um, this would be useful data to have, but it's equally, equally unclear as to why this cannot be done without the legislation. And I think my colleague, Polly McNeill, um, explained that much better than I would be able to do, not being heavily involved in this particular field. But I think that, that what the law is saying is, is there's so much that can be done without actually having to put this legislation in place, is my understanding. Um, so, if you could conclude, please. Yeah, no bother at all. So, uh, in conclusion, I support the position of my colleague, Pauline McNeill. Um, I don't think, on balance, I'd be able to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Maggie Chapman to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would like to begin by thanking all of the parliamentary staff from security and catering to official report and chamber desk who worked until after 10 last night to enable us to complete discussions on all the amendments. I welcome the provisions in this bill and I'm grateful to both the present and former Cabinet Secretaries for the constructive conversations that we've had. I thank the Criminal Justice Committee, clerks and the bill team who have worked so hard on all the details. And I am very grateful for the input of victims and survivors and the organisations that support them for all of their contributions. For this is a complex and technical bill which has required much work and rightly received much scrutiny. And I refer colleagues to my Register of Interests. This bill is fund fundamentally about reducing harm, both the harm done to survivors and victims of violent and abusive crime, and the harm experienced by people accused or convicted of crime. This is not a zero-sum game. Effective human rights-based justice means justice for everyone, and everyone benefits when we get it right. Scotland has not got it right so far, especially not for women and girls who have experienced gender-based violence. Far too often they have been treated by the criminal justice system with insensit insensitivity and disdain and have been denied vital information and have been placed in situations of distress and danger. So I entirely understand the concerns of individuals and organisations who are worried about the repeal of Section 23D of the 1995 Act, the presumption against bail. In a society of embedded misogyny, in a justice system that has repeatedly failed women and girls, I know how vital it is to have appropriate safeguards. But Section 23D has not always been an effective safeguard for all survivors of gender-based violence and domestic abuse. And its broad application, including to non-violent drug offences, prevents courts from making bail decisions on genuinely safety-based considerations. Instead, this bill specifically places those considerations at its heart. This, it says, is what matters critically, that both actual and potential victims are protected from harm. Properly implemented, and we are determined that it should be properly implemented, this bill should be far more effective than Section 23D in keeping victims and survivors safe. We know that prison is not a safe place. It is not, a, it is not safe for those who are incarcerated, including, as we discussed last week, women who have themselves experienced violence and abuse. And it is not safe for society, for communities and families receiving people from leaving prison. For the sake of those communities, rehabilitation and reintegration need to be deep-rooted realities, not pious pipe dreams. Prison makes that much, much harder. It is not soft, then, to demand more effective forms of justice. It's simply common sense. If we recognise that prison is not a good place to be for the defendant or for society, then refusing bail should be the absolute last resort. That's why cumulative tests are more appropriate than alternative ones. And let's not forget, people being considered for bail have not been found guilty. To curtail someone's freedom without trial requires, rightly, a substantial hurdle to be overcome. 
And in the same way, the restrictions and humiliations of electronic monitoring should not be lightly imposed or blithely disregarded. Electro electronically monitored bail is not full freedom, and that needs to be recognized in any subsequent sentencing. sentencing. It's entirely appropriate that the bill should make that principle clear. In conclusion, presiding officer, this bill is an important step on the journey towards a fairer and safer Scotland, one which, in which the criminal justice system, which so often acts to reinforce trauma and inequalities, instead works to counter, to redress and to heal them. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Fulton McGregor, the final speaker in the open debate. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Um, Scotland has one of the highest remand populations per head in the world. A claim that is often made that Scotland is soft in crime, but our use of prison and remand would suggest otherwise. The main purpose of this bill is to try and help reduce the remand population and to give a greater focus to the rehabilitation and reintegration of people living, leaving prison to help them resettle in their communities. Refocusing the use of remand is something that both the Justice Committee and I, which I am a member of, and the Scottish Government sees as a key priority. At committee, we noted that short periods of custody can often be detrimental, especially for those not yet convicted of any offences. Early last year, the committee unanimously supported a reduction in remand, and this is in line with the conclusions of the Justice Committee of the previous session, of which I was also a member, which noted that remand should only be used as a last resort. And although we have already acknowledged that in some cases remand is and will always be necessary for the first time, the bill makes clear that the court should specifically consider victim safety, which includes both physical and psychological harm to the alleged victim when applying the new bail test. This is something that we saw was strongly supported during our evidence gathering, and to lay any fears in this, statutory exclusions would prevent specific groups of prisoners from being considered under any early release process, and in addition to this, prison governors would retain a power to veto the early release of any eligible prisoner where this would present a known risk to a specific individual. The bill also aims to give a greater focus to the rehabilitation and reintegration of people leaving prison to help them resettle in their communities. We found that short periods in custody, including on remand, can actually be quite detrimental for effective rehabilitation. These short stints in custody also do little to address underlying causes of offending. And for example, Fergus McNeill, during the Stage 1 evidence, made this point very clearly, indicating that it can actually increase the chances of reoffending um, upon release. Short-term imprisonment can and does disrupt families and communities, adversely affecting health, employment, opportunities and housing. If in a stable situation, those three things are critical in preventing reoffending. A justice system which more effectively addresses the reasons why people offend and provides greater opportunities for rehabilitation benefits everyone and will lead to fewer victims in the future. Presiding officer, we've heard already part one of the bill means that the court is required to give Justice Social Work the opportunity to provide a report when considering bail. And I should probably at this stage just refer members to my register of interest as a, a registered social worker. Although we know this often happens anyway, it clearly varies by court and across the country. We spoke to social work and other organisations ahead of our stage one report. And I think it's fair to say that we need to match our ambition here with funding. I know that we have increased the criminal justice budget a bit, but to do this right, it might take even more, and especially so if savings can be found in a reduced remand population. More workers and court social work teams will allow for more detailed assessments and more joint up working, allowing voices of victims and third sector organisations to be heard, something which we all thought was very important. I also want to touch on the removal of section 23D, which was debated at length yesterday. I'd like the Chamber to know in our committee that we spent a lot of time on this issue and the, the convener has referred to that. And I'll read from our stage one report here briefly, and that probably summarises the position best. The committee has been acutely aware of the concerns expressed by some organisations representing victims of crime regarding the proposal to repeal section 23D. The com committee has explored with a number of witnesses what the impact of the repeal of section 23D will be and how in practice it will impact on bail decisions. The committee notes that there appears to be a view from many observers that, that removal of Section 23D would not impact on how the courts take into account the safety of victims. Furthermore, we heard arguments that the removal of Section 23D could bring some advantages in terms of better decisions by courts, as it would allow judges to exercise a, de a degree of discretion. And I think that, that perhaps, President Officer, sums up the 
the, the issues around 23D and where we've got to that. I can see that you're asking me to conclude. I did want to elaborate on the section 23D stuff, but on that note, presiding officer, I will conclude by saying that I fully support this bill and would ask members to vote for it at stage three today. Thank you. We move to winding up speeches and I call on Clayty Clark up to four minutes, please. I'm pleased to close this debate on behalf of Scottish Labour. We wish to see a reduction in the use of remand in Scotland, a greater role for alternatives to custody, more justice, social work involvement and better through care. We do not believe, however, the very significant concerns raised both by the justiciary and victims' organisations to the Scottish Government about this bill have been addressed and that this bill as drafted will achieve its policy aims. We accept the view from many legal practitioners that the lack of a definition of the new public safety test in this bill will lead to more uncertainty and appeals. And we note the strong opposition to this bill from Scottish Women's Aid, Assist and Victim Support Scotland and their concerns about the implications of removing Section 23D. Whilst the committee heard conflicting evidence on the wisdom of removing that clause, we do not understand why the Scottish Government is lowering the threshold in these most serious cases where the accused has analogous previous convictions, as those are the cases where remand is most likely to be appropriate. Indeed, it was as a result of bail being granted in such a case that these provisions were originally enacted following an accused who had been granted bail then committing offences of abduction, rape and murder. We have repeatedly asked the Scottish Government for examples of the kind of accused who would be granted bail, who are currently remanded if this bill passes, but that detail has not been forthcoming. We believe that there continues to be a lack of robust alternatives to remand available to the courts and support the development of more, more forms of supervised bail. Electronic monitoring has been less used in recent years in Scotland compared to other jurisdictions. And we believe there is great scope for a greater use of electronic monitoring as a bail condition to avoid remand. However, having spoken with Victim Support Scotland, we share their concerns about the current lack of tracking and monitoring with electronic monitoring and support the need for GPRS systems so there can be tracking. We also share the concerns of legal practitioners we have spoken with about the lack of a definition of the public safety test in this bill. At stage two, I put down some probing amendments with potential alternative wordings and also calling for the Scottish Government to provide a definition. However, we have accepted the advice of those within the legal profession who believe that it is safer to retain the current bail test, which is settled law, and of course, which provides a presumption in favour of bail in most cases. So we remain unconvinced that this bill will achieve its aims, that it will reduce the remand population, and believe that many of the concerns being raised are legitimate. Whilst there's much that we do agree on in part two of the bill, those provisions in the main do not require legislation and could be delivered now by the Scottish Government within the current legislative framework. For these reasons, we will not support this bill in this final vote. Thank you. And I call on Russell Finlay up to five minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I begin by thanking all of those who gave such insightful and informative evidence to the Criminal Justice Committee and also to our team of clerks for their hard work. Now, an essential role of government, of this parliament, and indeed of us as members, is to prioritise the safety of the people of Scotland. We should strive to ensure that people not only feel safe, but are safe, whether that's at home, on the street, in the workplace, or at school. Every single day, however, we hear distressing accounts of crime in our communities. 
These can include the most depraved and often devastating acts of violence. These are committed not just against adults, but also the most vulnerable, the very youngest of children and our cherished senior citizens. These can be life-changing, sometimes, of course, life-ending. And I believe unequivocally that survivors deserve justice and that we have a duty to ensure that is what they get. On many occasions, however, that is not what they get. Too often, the initial pain and shock of the original crime is compounded by the justice system. We keep hearing the same stories from survivors who feel disrespected, isolated and unimportant. The word betrayal is often used. Now, one of the most important stages in the process is at the very beginning, when an alleged perpetrator is arrested by the police. The bill that we are about to vote on seeks to change the law relating to what happens at this critical juncture. Is an accused person remanded in custody or released on bail? In the very short time that I have, it would be impossible to rehearse every detail of the bill's passage since its introduction last June, but some important contributions and observations must be revisited. The government's apparent intent for this law is to reduce the number of prisoners on remand. Yet my colleague Jamie Green has cited data showing that the number of prisoners being remanded has actually plummeted over the past decade. This revelation alone debunks and demolishes the government's entire justification for their legislation. This, incidentally, is exactly the same kind of crucial information which was withheld from the committee. Now, throughout the passage of the bill, there has been a background drumbeat. Some campaigners suggest, often implicitly, that old-fashioned judicial attitudes are to blame for Scotland's high remand rate. This morning, a BBC TV report reflected this narrative by saying that remand will now only be used as, and I quote, a last resort. Presiding officer, anyone who spent time inside a court or spoken with practitioners will know that is what already happens. Bail is always the default position. Sheriffs only remand someone after full and careful assessment of the individual circumstances of each case. Mr Green's statistics also confirm what many have suspected, that there is a more fundamental problem here, which is this. Scotland's stubbornly high remand rate is actually due to a failure of this government to properly fund our criminal justice system. It is little wonder that Scotland's most senior judge, the Lord President, gave the government's plans such short shrift. He described their consultation as, and I quote, a tick box exercise, which, again quoting, is simply an unacceptable way to deal with complex issues of such societal importance. There was a similarly scathing take from the Scottish Police Federation, who posed this question, what exactly is the problem that this bill is trying to fix? I wish I knew. I ask, why do we need this law that will tie the hands of sheriffs and make their ability to remand even more difficult? Again, I wish I knew. Last night, as we tangled with 90 amendments, three prominent victims groups, including Scottish Women's Aid and Victim Support Scotland, issued a press release urging members to vote against this bill. They said this is necessary to, and I quote, protect the interests of people affected by crime in Scotland. So as MSPs, we've got a choice. Do we prioritise the needs and the protection of victims, or do we instead seek to make life easier for those who commit crimes? I believe that essentially is the choice before us today, and our party will make the right choice. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Angela Constance to wind up up to six minutes, Cabinet Secretary. OK. Thank you very much, President Officer. I want to start by once again thanking all members for their contributions throughout the, the journey of this bill. I think we have, by and large, demonstrated that we can disagree agreeably. 
I would, however, like to point out to colleagues that the vast majority of government amendments that I brought forward in my name, uh, both at stage two and at stage three last night, were in direct response uh, to requests and comments uh, at either from members of opposition parties or indeed uh, victim support groups. And I just want to uh, reassure Chamber that um, even although at times we will uh, disagree and divide, that I will continue, even where I have to make decisions, will continue with that spirit of cooperation. I also want to once again thank my build team. They have had a lot to put up with, uh, not least uh, with a new Cabinet Secretary for Justice. But most of all, I do want to thank all of the organisations, including victim support organisations and other justice stakeholders, who have agreed or disagreed with the government in whole or in part. But it is important to acknowledge that there were numerous uh, pieces of evidence written and oral submitted uh, to the Criminal Justice Committee that either spoke in favour of the bill and its overall aims or for specific parts of the bill, whether that was Professor Fergus McNeill uh, or Sheriff um, Mackay uh, in terms of the Howard League, and there was also other uh, commentary from Social Work Scotland and Community Justice Scotland. And I would also point out to members that, that the progress that we are making in tackling the court backlog uh, and the progress that has been made in terms of the rollout of bail supervision schemes, uh, which is now um, evident in 30 local authority areas. But there is no doubt about it that we have all wrestled with big questions and hard decisions for government, for parliament and indeed our country. And nothing is more important to me than public and victim safety. And I know that I do not have a monopoly on that, that we all share that, even although we may disagree on how best to achieve that. This is the, the first time since 2007 that the bail test has been significantly reformed. Uh, and therefore, I think inevitably, it's been the, the centre of the debate. And I believe that in simplifying the bail test and embedding public and victim safety in all cases, we have strengthened it in regards that it shifts the focus rightly onto those who present the greatest harm. It speaks directly to those solemn cases that Section 23D sought to address. And while no bill, no bill is a silver bullet, this bill, presiding officer, will move us forward in refocusing what and who incarceration is for. Prison is for punishment, but it is also for rehabilitation. Prison plays a vital role in public protection, but it can also be an incubator for risk. Because the evidence shows that short periods, particularly for short periods of remand, that that can be damaging and disrupt the very things that prevent re-offending. A home, health, work and family. And I have no doubt that as we proceed in partnership in the spirit of both debate and support uh, and scrutiny, that we will indeed come back to the issues uh, in and around uh, community justice services. But there is a bigger prize, presiding officer, here if we have the courage to make some of those hard decisions going forward. And Liam MacArthur spoke to this because the reality is, and our collective challenge is, that if our prisons continue to deal with a high number of highly vulnerable people, people whose services and society have not served well, our prison and our justice system as a whole will be less effective in identifying and managing those who present the greatest risk. And that is not in the interest of victims and it's not in the interest of the communities that we all seek to sell and not, forgive me. I want to, President Officer, just finish where I started, that this is not the end of the journey, far from it, but it is a journey that we have to be prepared to continue. And the government, of course, as I'm sure other members will too, will come forward with other legislative plans and other non-legislative plans. But if passed tonight, presiding officer, this bill will introduce a new bail test that puts public and victim safety at its very court. 
its very core. For the first time, our courts will be required to consider the physical and psychological safety of victims. It will end Friday liberations, and for good reasons. It will place statutory duties on that wider public service to prepare prisoners for release. It includes measures to help remand prisoners. For the first time, there will be statutory through care standards. It extends the provisions of information about pr prisoner release to victim support organisations. It gives us more tools to support rehabilitation and reintegration. It gives more safeguards, more consultation and more review and reporting. And I do recommend this bill to Chamber. All of which, all of these actions will help to reduce reoffending and make our communities safer. Thank you. That concludes the Stage 3 debate on bail and release from Custody Scotland Bill. It's now time to move on to the next item of business. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. And the first is that Motion 9610, in the name of Natalie Don, on Children, Care and Justice Scotland Bill at Stage 1, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion 9158 in the name of Shona Robison on a financial resolution for children care and justice Scotland bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The parliament is not agreed. Therefore, we will move to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.